Hello everybody and welcome to Booktastic. If you've been with us all day, well done. It's been a brilliant day so far. Um, we're delighted that so many of you are still here with us and we're delighted that we've been able to welcome people from all over the country. If there's one positive thing that's come out of all of this, it's that we've been able to share our event with people beyond Bedford and beyond the UK in some instances. Um, we are disappointed that we're not being able to see you all in person and I know that you all love being able to come and meet the authors and the illustrators and hopefully, fingers crossed, next year we're going to be able to do that and we're working really hard. But for those of you who don't live in Bedford and are joining us from far afield, we are planning next year to do a hybrid event. So as well as being able to come along live to the festival, we're going to be live streaming it so you'll be able to join us wherever you are. Now, we're at the end of day two, but we have possibly saved the most exciting event for last. Perhaps she's best known for her work for older readers. Um, and Patrice has won multiple awards. She's included the Waterstones Prize, the Bookseller YA Prize, Crime Fest. She's been nominated and shortlisted for countless more. Um, and she was awarded an MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours earlier this year. And we are extremely honoured that she's joining us today. I can tell you, you are in for a treat. I mean, it's hard to resist a book that starts with toads dropping from the sky. And that's just one of the delights of Toad Attack while Diver's Daughter is an incredibly important story that opens up a whole part of British history that's frequently overlooked. And this is your chance to ask Patrice about her books. We've already received incredible questions, which we're extremely excited about. But if you click the uh, live Q&A button, you can pop all your questions in there. And by magic, we will relay them all over to Patrice. And now I'm going to shut up because none of you are here to see me or listen to me. You are here to see the incredible Patrice Lawrence. Welcome to Booktastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really lovely to be here with you. So I have got a, a I hate to say a PowerPoint presentation because who wants to sit in front of a PowerPoint presentation on a Saturday afternoon? But it's mostly lots of photos, including some of me when I was little. So I thought it was just a way of to trying to tell you about how all these different strange stories come out of my head and why they come out of my head. So we're going to share screen now and hopefully you can see that. And I'm going to go onto my screen. Fabulous. Right. You must all be so fed up of people clicking PowerPoints, but so this is, I want to tell you just a, a little bit about me. So these are some of the books that I've written for younger readers, Toad Attack that I'll be talking about, Diver's Daughter, and then there was kind of a reboot of Enid Blyton's Mallory Towers, and that, that's my, my girl there at the front, I'm so happy she got the front, and uh, Return to Wonderland, which was some backstories for um, Alice in Wonderland stories. Um, and my daughter knows me so well, because she said like, are you going to do like the, um, the flamingos and the croquet games, like actually I'm gonna do the hedgehogs because you know, they're the underhog and they never get their toys stole. So I thought I was gonna tell their stories. So why do I write all these sort of weird and wonderful stories? Well, find the Patrice. This is the first family that I lived in and I've never grown up in, I suppose, I don't know, I suppose you say traditional families. I've never lived with my biological dad. So my mum was a nurse. She came to England to train to be a nurse. I met my dad who'd come uh, from the Caribbean too to train to be a nurse. And they met me when they were quite young in Brighton as they were studying. And then when my mum became pregnant, um, she couldn't look after me because she needed to carry on her training. So she had a choice of like sending me to one of the many, many, many aunties who lived in Trinidad because my mum's the second youngest of 12. <laughs> Or I could have been adopted, but I was fostered and I was looked after by this family until I was four. And as you can see, they would loved me. I had a lovely time, um, but I always kind of knew I was different. But I just couldn't quite articulate it. And these are all the different families I've lived in. So um, there's me in my pink little pink dress at the top. And that was my foster mum, Auntie Phyllis. Um, I showed this picture to my daughter recently and she said like, mum, you got really chubby cheeks. Like, gee, thank you, Josephine. But they signed me up to the library, taught me to read from when I was little. So I always just had this love of books. And um, then next to that, that's when I was four and I went back to live with my mum. And it was a, a sort of period in fashion history when it looked like everybody took their sofas from a train. And it was quite difficult, my mum that well, but I'll talk to you later because we got to know each other through books. Then below that is me when I was older, I have my own daughter in Brighton. And that's my auntie baby who was 80 when she came to see us. 
everybody in the Caribbean has an uncle or auntie baby and no one can remember what their original name was. But auntie baby is a person that holds all our stories. And you must have someone like that in your family who knows the family history, um, the gossip, but also makes you feel sometimes that you belong, whether or not they're your biological family member or not. But auntie's the one who made me feel that I belong. In the middle is just a picture of my dad, my biological dad. Um, he split up with my mum before I was born, but I used to go and see him quite a lot. And he used to have a sort of basement room full of guitars and he played in a band. His name was Patrick Edward Singh. So I'm kind of named after him with my first name. And then at the bottom, that's my stepdad who brought me up since I was four. And Angelo's Italian. And he's probably the only Italian I know who doesn't watch football, so he's not going to be bothered about today. But he's always introduced me, this is Patrice, this is my daughter. And people look at him, and they look at me, and they look at my mum, and they would shake their heads knowingly, because how could I be his daughter? So I've always been part of a family where we're all different colours from all different parts of the world. So for me, family is a really big thing, a complicated thing, a messy thing. So I've always been interested in putting different types of families in my books. When I went back to live with my mum, uh, my mum is a massive reader and has always shaped the fact that I love reading. And my foster mum, Auntie Phyllis, was a big reader too. So books have always been part of my life. So what my mum used to do is she used to read books and then used to give them to me to read. So we could talk about them and it's a way we like we built a bond. So Little Women was a book. Um, I don't know if any of you have read it. And Joe, the character at the front in the green bonnet, actually wanted to be a writer. So I think that kind of sat in the back of my brain for a long time. And it's also actually a single parent family. So again, different type of family. Washing chair was one that I borrowed from my school library. And all I can remember about it is that the washing chair's wings got cut off and I cried my heart out. Um, Dr. Doolittle was one I borrowed from the library in Brighton. And it's a difficult thing because the original Dr. Doolittle was the original illustrations from Hugh Lofton are actually quite racist and not very nice. So some pictures of sort of African people in there. And I remember thinking at that time, is that supposed to be me? And I think I was about six when I read that. And again, that kind of shaped my relationship with books, thinking that the only time people like me were oh, in books were whether they were sort of these awful drawings. And then Wind in the Willows, my mum loved that. So she gave that to me to read when I was six and I couldn't manage it. Kind of this sort of, 20, this sort of Edwardian language. And then she gave it to me when I was seven. I said, like, oh, it's got a talking badger. Why would I read that? And then eight. And I was nine. It's like, I got it. I absolutely got it. So if you haven't read it, sort of Mole, it starts off, Mole is doing his housework and he drops everything and runs out. So relatable. And then he kind of moves in with, with Rat in a Riverside apartment and they have all these adventures. But there's one particular chapter that I really love where Mole feels really homesick and he's scared to take Rat back to show him his, his, his burrow because he thinks it's a, it's a bit shabby compared to Rat's. But actually they go back and Rat is really empathetic, really supportive. And it kind of made me think about where I lived in Sussex so as like me, my mum and my Italian stepdad. So we had great food. It was very loud. And my mum and my stepdad weren't married for a while, which was kind of unusual when I was growing up. So I used to think that my friends, my school friends, wouldn't want to come back to our house because it was the unusual house. But actually, what sort of Wind in the Willows taught me was empathy. If they're your friends, they don't care. And my friends didn't care. And I've had best friends since I was five. So writing books has always meant these things to me. This kind of taught me empathy, it taught me these squiggles on a page can make you cry, but also it made me feel a bit cautious because I thought people like me didn't belong in books. So Auntie Baby, the first time I went to Trinidad and actually met my Trinidadian family, because my mum's the only one who lives in England, um, she's the one who used to write me letters when I was little um, and send me little gifts like bracelets. And she's the one who holds all our stories. So she inspired me when I wrote my first stories that got published. So Granny Ting Ting came out um, quite a while back. And it was like, you know, those, I mean, you might have them in your schools, those kind of like educational readers, those sort of reading schemes. And this is about a boy called Michael who goes to Trinidad to meet his cousin, Shayla in Trinidad. And he thinks London's better. She thinks like Trinidad's better. So they have this, this sort of competition. But some of it's inspired by the fact that my mum can't ride a bicycle. I have tried to teach her. And also about Trinidadian food, like the pepper sauce, the tamarind balls, the, the fruit trees, all of those things. And also the legends that they have in Trinidad and the myths. 
And then the second book was Wild Papa Woods, which is another one of the reading schemes. And this was inspired by Papa Bois, who's like a mythical character in Trinidad. And he lives in the woods. And if you think somebody's coming to damage his woods, he changes into a stag. You can see the picture at the, at the top and he chases them away. So all of that side of my Trinidadian heritage, I didn't really know being born and brought up in England, kind of went into those first books inspired again by my family. So when I'm trying to write stories, I, my first thing is always what if. So this is me when I must have been about six, maybe. And I, I can't remember if it was Christmas or if it was a birthday. And I look at that picture of that doll in that pram. And firstly, I think, who, who would give that scary gift to a child? Why would you do that? And then I just think, like, what if, what if, what if? What if that doll came alive? What if I'm sitting there grinning at that camera and suddenly there's these, like, I saw these cold plastic hands on my neck? What if that doll stayed a doll, but it kept growing? So every day I'd look at it and I wouldn't be sure, is it grown a few millimetres? Suddenly its feet burst out that pram. What would I do? What if that doll really did come alive and then my mum preferred that doll instead of me and I had to leave and there's that whole gang of dolls trying to get children out of their houses? Everything for me is what if, and my head is always full of those stories, which is why I end up writing them down as my head would just go. So this was me when I was nine. Um, it was our official school photo before they brought in um, school uniform and it ruined my life. As you may see, I've always kind of liked a bit of yellow. And look at my hair there. My hair, the top of my hair has been a long running story. Growing up in Sussex in uh, the time I grew up, probably even now, it was, you, you couldn't get like edge control gel. You'd go in boots, try and find products for your hair and there's nothing for hair like mine. Um, and so my mum used to call that front of my hair, my shield. My daughter, who's actually 21, calls it my halo. So my hair stories are enduring. Now, about four years ago, I was looking after somebody's cat while they're on holiday in Kent and I set fire to my halo. Not deliberately, because that'd be really stupid. But I thought, oh, I'll be really healthy. You know, I'd, I'd buy some fish, I'd grill it. How do you work the stove? I was leaning over the stove, pressing the ignition button. And yeah, my hair went up. So I turned off the cooker, kind of, you know, put out the glowing hair, realised I still had my eyebrows. And then I saw the cat. The cat was looking at me. It was a big black and white cat called Gizmo. And if you could read the expression of that furry face, it was like, sis, like sis, yeah, like, like you're supposed to be looking after me, right? But you just flambeed your forehead. And I just imagine Gizmo going down to the harbour and sitting on a harbour wall and all the other local cats like arranged in a semicircle around Gizmo and Gizmo saying like, hey, like you fluffy, right? You complain that your owners don't give you whiskers or I am. You just get best in food. I feel you. I feel you, bruv. And you, yeah, whiskers, you complain that your owners don't get up at four in the morning to like, you know, open up the cat flap to let you out. I feel you too. But this woman, she just came down from London and she set fire to her head. So wherever you go, there's stories, even if they're at your own expense. And cat stories are the best. So toad attack, toad attack, that was really, I had a chance to write a book about anything. So what do you write a book about when you've got anything? You write about what happens if toads can fly. So you've got Leo, he walks out of his house one morning to go to school and a toad lands on his head. And that's Rosa. And Rosa's death, um, I worked, I mean, I'm losing my own hearing, but I also, at the time I started it, I was writing, uh, working with a, a colleague who's deaf. And um, and it just thought there's not enough deaf children in books because actually there are many people who, who have hearing loss. So Rosa is, is deaf. And Leo lives with his mum and his dad to have a failing umbrella factory and their granddad. So what do you do when your home is overtaken? Or your sort of, your, your village is overtaken by flying toads? So I reckoned you'd have like two opposing camps. You'd have the people who really want the toads because it's good, because you know it's environmental, don't kill animals. But then of course the toads, they can, they can, 
terrified cats, they will eat all your vegetables, particularly your school allotment. They will eat all your flowers. What happens and how do you get rid of them? So Toad Attack was kind of meant to be fun, but it was also inspired by an episode of The Simpsons when they get taken over by um, flying lizards. So again, if you like writing, you do a what if, what if, what if. You look at your cat. What if your cat could talk? What if your cat really got into mobile phones? What if your cat had like a mobile phone hacking gang? So all those scam messages that we get on our phones and the email aren't from humans, they're from cats who want to take over 5G technology and hold it to themselves and hold humans to ransom. What if, what if, what if? And do you know what? The more ridiculous it is, the better, because you marry together two really unique things and you can create your story. So think about it. Think about Take any animal and do a what if. What if elephants can ballet, ballet dance? What if ostriches really like sausages? Take it any way that you like. So to um, Diver's Daughter. So Diver's Daughter was is a part of a series of books called uh, The Voices series that are published by uh, Scholastic. And they were started by a writer called Tony Bradman, who's looking at a series on TV about black British history. And in many schools, maybe your schools as well, when Black History Month comes along, and that's if they do do anything around Black History Month, it's always American black history. So you might learn about um, Rosa Parks, or you might learn about Mar uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Or alternatively, you might learn about Nelson Mandela. But actually, in the UK, there is so much history because the UK has been a place of people coming to it from all around the world for centuries. So I was interested in doing something about Tudor times because there's a book for adults called Black Tudors written by Miranda Kaufman. And she's an academic and she went through like all the old documents to find um, proof of people of African descent being in the UK for a really, really long time. And one of the ones that I found really interesting was a diver called Jack Francis. And he was round in Tudor times because when a uh, boat sunk in a harbour, quite often they took down quite a lot of um, expensive treasures belonging to merchants. And those merchants wanted their treasures back. Local people couldn't swim. So um, a Italian, a Venetian merchant got together a small team of African divers. So they dived, or dove, didn't, went in deep. When the Mary Rose sank in Portsmouth Harbour to try and recover some of the stuff that's on it, and also for other ships in uh, sort of Southampton. Who knew? I didn't. We actually got to, when we wrote the book, I wrote the book, um, I actually got to go on Breakfast TV with Bally Ray, who wrote one of the other books called... Um, Oh, of course, it's about an uh, Indian soldier in, in Dunkirk, because again, that story is never told. Uh, unfortunately, I hadn't written my book yet, so I could kind of talk about it. But it was lovely having that moment in Breakfast TV, just to say there are so many stories in our own British history that we don't know about, that don't make it onto the school curriculum. But when you write stories, when you write books, you can weave it through. So I did a bit of research and I went to see the Mary Rose in a museum in Portsmouth, the Mary Rose Museum, and it's displayed beautifully. And, that, and when you go to the museum, again, it tells you lots of different stories about the people who live there. And I found that really fascinating. And there's also now an image, possibly, of what Jack Francis may have looked like, the diver. And he probably came from somewhere in one of the African countries, possibly an island, an island of Guinea. He possibly grew up a, um, learning to dive very deeply without um, equipment from quite a young age and also be able to surface again without getting sort of bubbles of, of natural air in your blood. But also what it told me is there are so many stories that we don't know about. So many stories. So this is Queen Nzinga of Ndongo Matamba, which is now in a quasi equivalent of Angola. And she was around about the same time that Queen Elizabeth I was around in, in England as well. And she was a warrior queen. And there were so many warrior queens in different African countries fighting sort of Europeans, who quite often from Portugal, who would try and take people and enslave them, but also around the different types of trade. She, I think she dug caves um, to hide people and hide goods. And also there were a lot of men as well. Um, who didn't want her to be queen, because they didn't want women to be queen, so she fought them as well. So again, there's all these different stories that now that we've got the internet, we can find out about. 
So that is me. I didn't want to talk to you for too long. And if there's some questions, I'd absolutely love some questions. That, Patrice, that was amazing. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. We have got a lot of questions here, actually. Let me just pull out some of the best ones. Wow. Okay. So I think you answered this a little bit when you were talking about it, but what drew you to the story of Eve in Diver's Daughter? Because um, I think you 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 um, heard about her dad, or oh sorry, the the, the true character, the, the male character. So did the publisher of the series give you the real life events, or was this a period in history that you chose? Uh, well, basically, I had I had a choice between um, choosing Tudors or Romans, and I'd actually just bought the hardback of uh, Black Tudors, and it cost me seventeen pounds ninety nine. So I thought I'm writing Tudors, <laughs> and I'd also heard like uh, Miranda talk about it as well. Also, the thing is, my mum is really in love with the Tudor period, so it was not a stately home or a sort of. Uh, a sort of suit of armour in the southeast of England that I had not seen because as soon as she learned to drive, we were like jammed in that car with a picnic and we went down all of them. And I actually really love Hever Castle in Kent where I think the Berlin family and Berlin's family lived as well. So I'm kind of quite fascinated by that, that period as well. And I think my mum loved Henry VIII just because he was a rebel. He wasn't that great to women, but he was a bit of a rebel. So I kind of liked that period. Um, I also wanted to make it a book because I was writing for voices and I wanted to make it a child story. So, you know, I could have written about uh, Jack Francis himself. Actually, I got really, I was living in London at that time. And I'm quite geeky about London history. So I was really fascinated to think, what would it be to be like a mixed heritage Tudor child living in Southwark during Tudor times when they still used to display <laughs> Apologies for the gruesomeness, but when they were still sort of chopping off people's heads for, for sort of worshipping the wrong part of, you know, if you were, uh, if you're still Catholic and Catholic conspiracies, and they still used to display them on spikes on the south side of London Bridge. So if you lived in Southwark, you'd come out your house and see a load of heads displayed on spikes. Um, when, it's, when, a two, when the sort of Thames was still really wide, because I hadn't put in the... Um, Obviously, in Victorian times, they built the sewers, so they made the Thames a bit narrow to hide the sewers, but it's still really wide and it flowed really quickly. Um, so it's, and it had Bartholomew's Fair as well, so I've read loads about that. And it was such a mad, smelly, sort of vibrant, exciting time, I think, in Tudor times. So I could go down a research sort of, um, you know, vortex. But I suppose the other thing for me, quite seriously, is poor people's stories don't often get told. So quite often what you see, you know, when you research Tudors, you see pictures of people in large ruffs and expensive clothes and those sort of uh, you know, aristocratic families. And it's their stories that get written down. You don't hear about poor people. So I really wanted to, to sort of hear about poor people as well. So all of those things like sung to my imagination. Yeah, I bet. And there's something about the Thames as well, isn't there? It's just, it's it's got a very mythical feel to it. And there's lots of there's lots of stories I think that you could pull out of the Thames, no, no, no pun intended. But um, I think absolutely, there are some. I mean, I, I, I'm really fascinated by this story by Diver's Daughter, and I, I was digging around a little bit to find out more about that era. And there is that. Um, is it John Blank? Who was yeah. The, I mean, there's some incredible stories from that era. Just some, fa and and he he could read and write when not a lot of people could at that time. So it's just fascinating to yeah. hear more about that time. I mean, John Blank was um, a trumpeter, and I think he actually asked, there's pictures of him. And I suppose the other reason I suppose the story really appealed to me is I remember when I was about seven or eight, and I always loved writing from when I was when I was little. And there was some homework where, where we had to pretend to be somebody from history and write a story. And that really should be up my street. But actually, I remember bursting into tears and saying to my mum that there was nobody like me around in Elizabethan times. Aww. But my mum actually knew that there was. And I just think if I was that age and I saw those pictures, for instance, of John Blank and other people of colour that were around in England in, in sort of those times, it made me feel more that I belonged and I wasn't just sort of like an alien sort of arrived here. And I think, yeah, John Blank, I think he asked, yeah, didn't he ask Henry VIII for a pay rise or something yeah. and, and got presents for his and wedding? Pension. Yeah. And pension, he, he was, so he had that, he could read and write. He was clearly of a, of, of a high status. Um, and not many people could in that time. So it yeah. was, you know, I just, I love, I think the Voices series is amazing for that because 
these are real, I mean, they're, they're, they're fictional stories, but they're based on real things. And there's, this is something that we don't really know about. It's, 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 it's amazing. And I love, I love that Voices series. Have you ever thought, is there any plan to do any more of those? Or? Um, not necessarily for me immediately, um, because I've just got some other things. But there are, I think, they've done, I think I'm of it's five or six now. So it's all sort of different ones. And I think what's really clever about it is that it fits into the curriculum. So yeah. schools could just order them into the library and make them part of your teaching and discussions. And I think, you know, for, for certainly for, for children of colour as well, it just makes you feel included because everything in your history books tells you that you don't exist. Yeah. When actually London, especially in England, even wider, has always been a global place. So yeah. people have always come here and there's so much proof of it. Just kind of putting you back in a history where you should be in the oh, first yeah, exactly. place. So how difficult was it moving from YA to, and from contemporary YA to historical children's fiction? I think it's, it's interesting because I think because well, the YA I write is contemporary and because I lived in London, people always, I don't know, there's a presumption that it would come easily where I research everything I do anyway. So with YA, I'd get the young people's voices just by sitting on buses and listening to people speak and making notes of it all the time. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I um, explore in YA, I do a lot of research about as well. So in a sense, all of it is about research and detail. I think the problem, not the problem, but I think it was tougher for Diver's Daughter because I didn't really know much beyond Tudor time other than that I'd seen on like TV or sort of, you know, watch, watch Elizabeth again on, on, you know, on the film or um, learnt at school. So I, again, I had to do lots of research. So it's quite little things that you have to research. So did the word breakfast exist? You know, what did they eat? Um, how did you know? If you cook something in a saucepan and it was stuck to the bottom of the saucepan, how did you scour it when you didn't have cheese? You know, all of these things. Ooh. Which is actually useful because it actually gave me a plot point when she went to find some stuff like scour it with like ah, ah you know um, the minutiae that's the fascinating. Yeah. Thing. How did you get boats from Southampton to London? Did they sail on the coast? How did you travel if you didn't have any money from London down to Southampton? You know, how would you did you hitchhike on a coach? You know, so it's quite sort of really small things that I had to sort of look up. And then, you know, what shoes did you wear? Because the only shoes you, you know I found were like the um, posh ones that the you know the um, affluent families wore. But if you're poor, what did you do? You know, so. It, that was a lot of research in there but in the end you sort of get into for me I start with characters so I really wanted to start with Eve's character but also in terms of her mum I imagined that her mum would have been enslaved and sort of travelled for Europe so therefore she would she would have moments when she'd feel quite depressed when her history you know you're poor as well so that would all get on top of you so part of it was giving a, a humanity to people who often don't have humanity and I just think that's what all writing is doing. So you're kind of bringing all of those things and just taking it back for 600 years or so. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you've, you've, um, you've answered this to a degree, um, but some, someone's asked, how did you do your research and have you got any tips for writing stories from the past? And obviously what you've just said there partly answers that question. Um, but where, how, where else do you get your, where else do you do your research? Well, I, I think what I do is I always start with, with, uh, I mean, I start in a way that I start, I suppose, with all books. I start with a character, so I knew kind of a sense of my character. Then what I tend to do when I'm starting a story, the bare bones of a story, is I give the character a fear. So what are they afraid of? So with Eve, it would have been at the beginning with drowning and with water. So she's got this fear of drowning. So you can up the ante when, um, when and you also to that find out that her mum can dive as well. So you can use her fear to sort of build tension. Then I always give them something precious as well. And I also give them a desire. And that might change. What is it that they want? You know, what they want is like a happy life. Want enough money to live happily. You want to feel safe. You want for your mum to be okay. So, so I kind of work out all of those little things and about how I can build those, those in. And then I sort of go back and think, what do I need to know about? So with there, I start with, where would they be living? What would that be like? So there's some old maps of London that you can find and look at and what's Southwark like. And I was like, oh, he's got little water stairs, you know. Yeah. And then you just ask yourself basic questions. How would I get across the town? So there's a bridge. And if the bridge is really busy, as it was, it's London Bridge was the only one. And there's like massive traffic jams. But it's all about the worry boats. What would that look like? So you just keep asking yourself questions yeah. about how would they do that? And as you ask yourself questions, you can build little pillars of, pillars of your plot as well. So, you know, if the worry boat means you could possibly drown, it up, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
and old maps are a I love looking at old maps of London and just seeing the, 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 the progression and the change is amazing. It is, and particularly the difference between um, before the, the sort of Great Fire and then afterwards as they're rebuilding it, as a lot of the churches went and then came up again. And it's really, really fascinating, really. And because I'm not very good at visualising things, I have to go to places. So I went to Southampton and spent a weekend there. And I still got the medieval walls up. So I kind of walked around and touched some of those medieval walls and I had to think about it, stayed in a hotel that used to be a coaching inn. I mean, there's not much of that inside, but the whole structure of it, you can see like where the horses would have come through, where the stables would have been. Um, I sort of also said, yeah, went to the Mary Rose uh, Museum. Um, so I had to actually go and see things and stand by this sort of, this sort of what's left of the Mary Rose and try and envisage what those boats look like but they've also got some really good displays as well in there about boats sort of of that time so if you kind of kind of in any ways that you can immerse yourself in a history and actually walked from where I used to live in East London down to Greenwich so I could have a sense of going east and looking at the flow of the river the colours of it because it's wider there where the docks used to be went under the old the sort of foot tunnel popped up in Greenwich and walked around the um what used to be the old sort of Siemens um, hospital and before that, you know, where the palace used to be, the Tudor mm. Palace of Placentia. And so I am I actually have to see things. I have to see the physical yeah. things and get a sense of them to get that history. And I think that's good because you can just close your eyes and immerse yourself in it. Oh. And you can imagine your characters there. So if you have a chance to do that, I'd really go on site and just try and imagine that yeah. person in that place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so actually, I've got a lovely question from Evie, who's 10, who would like to know what inspired you to become a children's author? Well, I grew up not thinking that I could be, so I just loved writing. So when I was little, um, I used to write uh, lots of poet poems. So if anything happened in our house, rather than sort of, uh, I'd write a poem about it. So for instance, once, I was about seven or eight, and I was sort of sitting in a sitting room, and I had a explosion, and I went into the kitchen, and we had like one of those um, metal, I, I can see one here actually, like had it a brandish, you know those metal coffee pots that you yeah. can put on a hob? Because yeah. we were trendy in our house long before like, you know, cappuccinos and espressos came trendy because my Italian stepdad, so we always had coffee. And um, I think my mum hadn't put in one of the seals, so it sort of, it boiled and boiled and boiled and then it exploded. And it was like coffee on the walls, coffee on the ceiling, coffee on the dog. Did I clear up? Like, no, wrote a poem about it. Right. And like, in the, I mean, you have to, don't you? And then, like, another time we were in Italy because we used to go to Italy for like the whole of the summer holidays to see my stepdad's family. And we were having a picnic, and my mum came shooting out of a bush, screaming with like a, a worm, like the size of a, like an anaconda. Well, not literally, wrapped around her ankle. Like, did I comfort her? Like, no, I wrote a poem about it. So I think that was always my way of expressing myself. And I think maybe oh, wow. because I grew up in all those different families that were very different from everybody else's, but I, that was what I was used to. But I wasn't, I didn't know how to articulate my difference. And sometimes if you are different, you don't want to think about it because that makes you feel different from everybody else. So I think my way of dealing with it was writing stories and poems. And then when I had, my, my brothers are much younger than me, so they're nine years younger and 15 years younger. So I used to write them stories too. And I think maybe it was my way of putting them in stories because there was obviously no children's books or children of color in them. So I used to write about a giant purple rabbit called Chiggerwig who rode a massive carrot over the moon. And I think, you know, I should really pay my brother's therapy bills for it. But I used to sort of like write and kind of illustrate it for my brothers. Um, and then I, when I got to secondary school, I was really lucky that I had some fantastic, two fantastic teachers who really encouraged me to, to write. And when my first book for, for teenagers, Orange Boy, won a couple of prizes. I mean, I hadn't seen them since I'd left school, but both of them found me on social media and congratulated me. And it meant that actually I could say thank you to them for encouraging me and for telling me that I could be something that I didn't think I could be. So I wrote stories just simply because of my love of writing stories. And just somehow accidentally enough people had confidence in me to enable me to be a writer. And I'm still, honestly, still a bit astonished myself. <laughs> We're going to a bookshop, I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody's got my name. Oh no, that's me. <laughs> I think it's really, I think 
people underestimate the power of a good teacher, don't they? I yes. know, you know, when you find somebody, and especially at that formative age, who believes in you and tells you something, tells you that this is true about you, and it becomes true, and it becomes your truth, and that's so so powerful. It's true because we hear sometimes, you know, the, the the other side of that when people say, "Oh, in my teachers and I was rubbish at rubbish at maths or initial science," and I believe them, and you sort of carry that doubt around with you, and then you get the positive side of it when teachers say, "You're really good at that. You know, you can do it," and you build that belief, particularly if you're not from. You don't have that. I mean, I've, I come from a bookish home. You know, my house was always for my mum's a big reader. But I was the first to be born in the UK. So you don't necessarily know how things work. Yeah. Whereas for my own daughter, it'd be very different because I know how things work. Yeah. So the possibility yeah. of being published, I have no idea. Yeah. It was just not a possibility for me ever. Not even something that I could think would be a possibility. So I think it was just, yeah, for me, it was story. But then it was those people who believe in you and help you get there and that's still and it's still happening librarians are amazing in schools and in getting books into into young people and children's hands you know I've met some fantastic booksellers as well who really promote you now you've got social media they support you and I think all of us need that little sort of around us still even at my age to say you can do that and I think that's why it's so important that you do events like this because I think seeing you and hearing you it allows children to go oh hang on I can do that yeah. because there's this almost vicious circle of if you don't see it you don't do it and then if you don't do it there are less people you're not there to to inspire the next generation and so when children see somebody who looks and sounds and has the same stories as them doing it they go oh actually this is something I can do absolutely and that's again and that's why I talk about my families and about you know having a foster family I mean you know, my stepdad when you know his mama, he was a kitchen porter, you know, so working class family. Then we had a fish and chip shop in Littlehampton for 20 years. So, you know, it's that's my background fish and chip shop takeaways. Um, a very working class family as well. So, you know, class comes into it a lot. So, that's why I talk a lot about that. You know, this is, but for me, that's not a deficiency, that's just that's massive stories I can write about so much. You know, I can take you to so many different worlds because of my family background. So, you know, for all children and young people who think, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not like writers. The more stories you've got, you know, if, you, if you've grown up in multi-ethnic households, if you're the first in your family to be born in England, if you've got, you know, family from roots in lots of different places, lots of different experience, you will be amazing writers, absolutely amazing. There was, I did a, I had a lovely conversation. Uh, I was trying to think about different things we could do for the book festival and different ways of telling stories. And I was talking to this incredible doctor of, of horticulture. And I was saying, can you tell stories with gardens? Do gardens tell stories? And she said, well, I mean, people who um, come to this country to live from other countries, their gardens tell amazing stories. Yeah. They'll bring plants with them. And, they're in, and I was like, oh my God, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I used to have an um, allotment in London, in sort of North London. So other people had allotments just came from all around the world. So people just grow so many different things. And I think there's a sort of Turkish or Kurdish family in, in the allotment next to us. And they're like, make pita, which is kind of like a sort of thin, thin pizza with like the spinach that you just picked on top of it and brew Turkish tea and would oh. swap stuff. And then, you know, people would grow sort of stuff that, no, climate change, stuff that was from the Caribbean. And, and so, yes, it definitely, absolutely, gardens could tell amazing stories. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, we've got a lovely question here about um, toad attack and the fact that it's part of the super readable range at Barrington Stoke, which is very close to my heart because my daughter is dyslexic and she struggles a lot. Um, how did you become how did you become part of that? And how did you find it? Was was it a different writing process writing for, for super readable books? I think it's a different, eventually a different process. And I mean, I absolutely love Barrington Stoke. I think they're really amazing. And also what they do is they say to you, like, write a story. They don't tell you what to write or anything or any, you can write one for younger people, you can write one for older people. It's like, yay! <laughs> you can write anything. So yeah, I write about flying toads. Um, I think with Barrington Stoke, because the language will change, because it has to be readable, particularly at the beginning. Because if you're dyslexic, you don't want to struggle to get into that story. You want to get into that story and, and then be invested in it. And maybe if the sort of the letters aren't quite working for you, you might have to work harder later, but not at the beginning. Why would you want to do that? You know. So you really need to think about your story, I think. And I think it was interesting because I'm not used to writing that young. 
So I did it deliberately as a challenge to myself because I think I like to be able to write different types of stories. I wanted to write something that's fun. And also you need to really think about your story more than you're thinking about your language because the language will change and be edited depending on how readable it is. So you need to have a strong story that can withstand that, I think. Yeah. So, and but like most things, I just think, what do I want in my stories? Because I sort of have little building blocks that will shoehorn into there. So if I want an umbrella factory, there will be an umbrella factory. Of course there'll be an umbrella factory. Yeah. And I think really, I think I, one of the things that I'm really, I love about Barrington Stoke is that quite often if you're, if, if, if there is a, a range of publishers that are writing books for a specific group, you know, so so for children with, with reading challenges, they're not given as much importance. And yet Barrington Stoke get people like you to write for them. They, they get, um, you know, amazing, famous, you know, well-known, well-respected authors to write the books. They're not, they're not making them a second-class thing. They're making them really important. They're saying to you that you are important. And I think that's amazing. Yeah, and the authors just love writing for Barrington Stoke, I think. It's just a, it's a real privilege to do that because we just know how much they value every single book that comes out of them and, and you as, as an author. So it feels like a real privilege to be asked to write for them. Oh, so um, this is a nice question. Which do you enjoy more, working on more serious teen books or the younger children's books? I don't think there's an either or. And I think with these sort of teen books, I always put loads of stuff I love in them deliberately. So with the last one that came out, Eight Pieces of Silver, there's a lot about uh, K-pop, Korean music, K-pop music in there. Lots of stuff about Marvel films. I spent a lot of my life watching Marvel films. So I'm certainly going to make use of those hours and put them in a book. Um, so and Lord of the Rings as well. The hours of those films I've watched because I've heard of films in the books. It's like too many elf songs in the book, seriously. Yeah. So it's, the it's, you know, the films are, are better. So again, hours of my life have gone into watching those 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 sort of uh, films over many years. So I think the research sometimes I tip it to things that I really like. But I like for me again, it's just going back to I just love absorbing myself in stories and like thinking of a character and working out where they can go and what they can do. So for me, it doesn't. I won't say it doesn't matter because obviously depending on your readership depends what you can write about and how you write it but all of it for me is just different ways of telling stories so there's no preference I just love I really do love all of it and I just feel again absolutely privileged to be able to do that and so actually in, in with that in mind have you ever thought about do you plan to write for adults yeah <laughs> so actually before I wrote I always thought I didn't know I started writing my first book by Teen Orange Boy by accident because I thought it was actually an, an adult book. I didn't actually, I'm ashamed to say this. I didn't know that YA existed. I just thought they were like books. Yeah. And um, so I thought I was writing a crime book. So I used to love reading. When I was like 13 or 14, there was no sort of YA. So I went from yeah. children's books to reading like Agatha Christie crime books. Um, so I read like all the Miss Marples, all the Poirots, all the ones that were neither this nor that. Mm -hmm. um, then I started reading Stephen King horror books because he's actually really great at story and plot and taking a sort of idea and a concept and creating something around it. Um, and I thought I really wanted to write adult crime books like set in 1930s East London. Um, so I started doing that and then I went on a writing course, uh, a residential writing course for a week. And from a writing prompt, he woke up dreaming of yellow. I ended <laughs> up writing Orange Boy. And it, actually it was because, and again, for writers, the writers out there get people to send you writing prompts and then just free write. And when I say free write, it's just you, whatever that, that sentence, that writing prompt, that sentence or that picture takes you, Right. It doesn't matter if it's nonsense, because actually what you get out is some really interesting stuff that's in the back of your head. And that yellow made me think that there'd been a teacher strike like a week before. And being a really thoughtful parent, I've taken my daughter, who was then year seven, to Hyde Park Winter Wonderland. And we spent all the time complaining about how expensive it was. And we just had enough money to get one hot dog between the two of us. So I thought, oh, yellow mustard and fairgrounds. And I just free wrote, there's a 60 year old boy and he's at fairground, it's on a day and there's a hot dog and there's mustard. And just let all the thoughts tumble out of my head without editing them. Just let them tumble and it's, you'll be surprised where they take you. So yes, I would like to write. And also because my daughter, whose stories and friend stories I stole for like five years, is now an adult. So I need to steal her adult stories. Perfect. Why not? Draw what you've got. Use what you've got. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's um, a lovely one here, actually, and I'm always interested to, to find out what inspires people. 
who are your favourite children's authors and what's the one children's book you could reread forever? Oh gosh, that's really hard because now I've met a lot of them and you know, you, you don't want to you don't want to break new friendships. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, going back to, I suppose, Wind of the Willows is one, I haven't read it for a while, but simply because it means so much to me, because it kind of, um, it helped bring me and my mum together, I think. And I think once, when I became a mum and I had a, had a, had a child, I realised how you um, bond together in those first four years, the things you do. And I hadn't had that with my mum because we didn't live together. So... Um, I think Wind in the Willows, I think I'd like to go back and visit it, but I'm a bit scared sometimes to re revisit books that I've read at a certain time, yes. just in case that you, you know, they're not as good as, as you could be. So, but I will, I think that was one probably. And, yeah, I reread books all the time, and every time I reread them, I get something different out of them. So I suppose you're bound to, it's bound to have changed in some way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh gosh, we, we were at time, but I could just talk to you forever. You, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. I suppose, really, what we'd love to know mainly is what what are you, what are you, what's happening next? What's coming next for you? <laughs> trying to think about things. Things publishing, you do things. It's like, oh, you mustn't tell anybody. So I'm trying to remember what I can tell people. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Um, well, I'm writing another book for, for Barons and Stoke, but I, I'm literally I've written like, you know, a thousand words out of like 20,000. So <laughs> um, I've got my the next book for sort of teenagers comes out in August called Splinters of Sunshine. That's in both London and, and sort of the South Coast. Well, weirdly enough, I now live. But that's funny enough, got lots of wildflowers in it. It's about, you know, a girl who inherited a book that of uh, wildflower drawings from her, her grandma. So even though she's struggling in life, a lot of the way she thinks is shaped by by wildflowers, I think. So that's, yeah, that's sort of coming out in August. And just writing on lots of, and then next March, the a book for Noted Crow, a picture book called My Grandma Came on the uh, Empire Windrush <gasps> should come out. So it took us a, a while to get an illustrator and we've now got a fantastic illustrator. Yeah. So that'll be out next. Uh, Can about you yeah. illustrator is? Yeah, uh, her name's Camille Sucre and she's sort of based in, in the States, but she's got uh, actually links to Trinidad and the Windrush. Wow. So that's really fantastic. And it's about a kind of little girl who's trying to look for something to dress up on dressing up day at school. So she sort of tries different, you know, she'd go park um, um, Rosa Parks or, you know, different people, Mary Seacole or whatever. And then she's, her grandma's got like a dressing up sort of trunk so yeah so that will come that's out next year as well and there's other bits and pieces that I can't say that but I'm just I like writing lots of different things at the same time it, it, it keeps me <laughs> keeps oh, my brain alert I can't wait and, and it's gonna I'm, I'm so excited and I'm so grateful to you for joining us today it's been amazing and, and thank you so much for asking me thank you oh, I just and the question clearly in the chat and in the questions everybody has loved listening to you and, and, and are so passionate about your books and about your re and about your writing um, and I'm sure, actually, from listening to that, you all want to buy these books that you've heard of. We've got a whole page of Patrice's um, books. We've got a whole section on our online shop that you can go and find those. And I think the link came out to you when you uh, when you got your registration for this event. So do go and go and have a look at those and keep your eye out for these books that are coming out next year. Um, wow. This is the end of day two of the festival and already I can't really believe how many incredible people we've had on. Um, yet we've got another full day tomorrow with David Litchfield, Alex Latimer, who's beaming in from South Africa. Um, we've got Zanid Mian, who is talking to us about her Planet Omar books. We've got Gareth P. Jones, Raymond Antrobus, Polly Dunbar. I, 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 this, we've been utterly spoiled by all of you. And thank you, Patrice. And I'm sure everybody at home is desperately screaming. Thank you for coming and talking to us. Um, and, and yeah, we're just very, very grateful. Thanks for being part of Book Festival. Thank you so much for asking me. Thanks. Bye. Bye.